Up next, uh, we have Hugo Williams. Hugo is a second year student reading philosophy Up at next, Peter uh, House. We have Hugo Williams. Thank you, Madam President. It was a great service both to the theory and the practice of politics when Isaiah Berlin presented his analysis of positive and negative freedom. Put very simply, negative freedom is the absence of obstacles, whereas positive freedom is having the opportunity to realize your own projects and potential as a human being. A meaningful version of liberty must include both, since each one, without the other, is ineffectual. Now, freedom of speech is uh, almost always discussed in terms of negative, theory, in negative liberty. The debate is about the extent and the nature of censorship. And for good reason, as you've heard tonight and as you'll hear again, the obstacles that people face here and around the world when they try to speak truth and try to say their piece are enormous. But in obsessing over negative liberty, we should not lose sight of what meaningful liberty is and what it is supposed to achieve. And we should not assume that because we have the privilege of coming to this chamber and hearing both sides of the argument, that our freedom is not under immediate and serious threat. So I'd like to make a point which perhaps runs at a right angle to what I think will be the main focus of the debate tonight. Um, but I hope that it motivates a slightly richer analysis and a, a richer picture of what freedom of speech is and ought to be. And I by no means want to underplay the, the threat from censorship either by institutions or by a mob. Now I think everyone can agree that freedom of speech, at least any version of it that's worth having, presupposes freedom of thought. But I think that without positive action from all of us, that freedom, which by its nature has defied even the most successful attempts at totalitarianism, may soon have had its day. It's a little tricky to say exactly what we mean by freedom of thought. The pattern free speech is being able to say what you want to say won't work, since to want to think something, you must already have thought about it. It comes up being trivial. So I think a better approach is freedom of thought being the freedom to think in the way that you would like to think. And for most of us, at least for important political and cultural issues, that way is best summed up as rationally. So freedom of thought is the freedom to make judgments according to our best rational faculties. The negative component is a given. Mind control is still the stuff of science fiction. But for the positive component, we require an opportunity for everyone to fulfill their potential in becoming their fully rational selves. Now, there's an obvious, slightly hackneyed point to be, make from, to be made from here about disinformation. Of course, without the right facts, we can't hope to make the conclusions that we would want to come to. But fake news is, is nothing new. And I think a healthy dose of skepticism will solve most, if not all, of the problems that it raises. Far more dangerous, far more subtle, are the growing psychological interventions that online media is making on us. Two extreme examples will help illustrate what I mean by this. Radicalization, be it political or religious, shows how some glossy production values and a monopoly on someone's attention can completely neuter their rational faculties, driving them to inexplicable and unjustifiable acts of violence. Trolling and online bullying and online hate, which in the worst cases has driven people to suicide, shows how an opinion that everybody appears to hold has the power to get at something as personal and intimate as your own attitude towards your own emotional life. Or think of the billions that are spent on advertising and the forensic techniques of big data that let whoever is willing to pay enough know exactly which of your buttons to press. Product placement, influences, even just appearing on your screen regularly enough have real effects on your behavior as a consumer. Mm -hmm. Then consider how social media companies design their platforms to monopolize your attention most effectively. There is a whole industry one that is becoming a bigger and bigger part of our lives based solely on its ability to undermine your rational faculties. But where does politics take place these days? 
Where are the cultural issues of the day decided? Where do people go to make up their minds? They log on to Twitter or to Facebook or to YouTube, which will bombard them with content which quietly reinforces their prejudices, which appears to have, a, have approval from wide society and is over in 140 characters. Add to this a couple of well-funded vested interests and the potential for Cambridge Analytica-style villainy is enormous. Whatever you think about the Brexit campaign, you must surely agree that the most effective parts of it were not Boris Johnson's appearance at the televised debate, nor any critical exegesis of the Maastricht Treaty. It was instead short-form media that pulled on people's heartstrings and in both directions. You don't need to believe the stories about foreign interference in British or American elections to recognize the danger. It was once hoped that the internet, by enabling the free flow of information, would make the liberalization of China a given. Now, we've seen tonight that that's not the case. But not only has the Communist Party successfully uh, restricted its subject's use of the internet, but it's turned it into a tool for indoctrination pumping out millions of fake posts in praise of the regime. But the crucial point to make is that no malicious actors are required for our freedom of thought to be undermined. How these platforms are designed and how they work makes staying level-headed extremely difficult. Firstly, it is impossible to see a piece of information or an opinion without seeing at the same time exactly how popular it is since the likes or the upvotes or the shares are inevitably printed directly alongside them. I take it that humanity's tendency and desire for conformity is well documented and well understood, and the recurrence of the same post being shared has a similar effect. The worst totalitarians of them all knew the power of repetition. Secondly, as was mentioned briefly, the tailoring of content to the apparent interests and prejudices of the user mean that any view which doesn't fit your worldview is unlikely to make its way onto your feed. Those preconceptions that ought to be at the center of rational debate are hidden in the monotony of an output curated by an algorithm. And if you, if you have never had to consciously commit to your biases, how can you be fully committed to their conclusions? Without a balanced diet of fairly presented opinions, we are denied the opportunity to make up our minds in the way that we would want to. Thirdly, the immediate demands that these platforms make on us to make up our minds, often in a very public way, cause us or push us into making ad hoc decisions. It took only a couple of, couple of hours for the internet to turn decidedly against J.K. Rowling, even though the issue at hand was, for many people, unfamiliar and certainly not trivial. And you can hardly say that the state of affairs several hours later was conducive for rational argument, or a fertile ground for rational people. The hashtags, the temporary profile pictures, the cancellations, they force us to pick a side before we have had the time to work out what the debate is really about. This is no platform for rational argument. It is no way to make reasonable, reasonable judgments, and it is no place for a free-thinking person. What an empty promise is the lack of censorship when this is the environment amidst which we are asked to form our views. There are unprecedented forces alienating us from those methods of thought which we have committed ourselves to, and they are denying us the opportunity to fulfill our potential as rational agents. Do not be deceived by a libertarian approach from government, and do not be deceived by an apparent plurality of publications. If there is no public forum that facilitates and encourages rational thought, then we do not live in a free society. Because free speech is not just about saying whatever you want, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. It is not about the right to offend or the right to make a joke. It is part of a wider humanistic project, one begun by those great thinkers of the Enlightenment, John Locke, Rousseau, J.S. Mill, who saw reason as the guiding light of humanity, freeing us from the tyranny of superstition. They dreamt that humanity might be a race of free agents, acting in accordance with their own unique ends and eccentricities, and following their own rational judgment. 
unless we find a much better way of giving people the opportunity to become their fully rational selves, that dream is dead. <laughs>